confirmation. We are live. So awesome. Straight no chaser. Uh, it's <laughs> there's no uh, no preview either. So it's just us live directly onto YouTube right now. Um, if I may, just really briefly, uh, in lieu of any kind of preview uh, intro that we normally do for our news show or our news segment, I just want to briefly introduce our guest tonight, one Roger Veer. Uh, stop me at any point if I get this wrong, but one of Bitcoin's earliest investors, advocates, and public faces. Uh, one of the first to ever publicly promote and advocate the use of Bitcoin for commerce and for day-to-day -day use and as something of a cash replacement. Uh, the owner and operator of, or at this point, partial operator of Bitcoin.com Bitcoin and the public face of the project with the ticker symbol BCH, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, I know I've missed some other things such as uh, at least former Nogi Submission Wrestling participant and Jiu-Jitsu uh, aficionado, but um, we'll get into that, I'm sure, later on. Welcome. Thank you. I, I guess uh, credit where credit is due, though, uh, to Ross Ulbricht, the founder of the Silk Road, because he was actually the first person to really get people using uh, Bitcoin in commerce. I was the first person to get people, you know, promoting them to use Bitcoin in commerce for above board, uh, you know, traditionally government regulated type uh, businesses. But uh, credit to the, so this, but the Silk Road was my inspiration when I heard about that. I think it's, uh, you know, it's one of the most philosophically interesting things uh, to have ever happened in my lifetime. It was really an, an incredible, incredible thing. And for those that don't know, uh, he's now condemned to die in prison for having the audacity of setting up a website that allowed people to buy or sell anything that was peaceful. And uh, if you think that that's a travesty, that one of the guys that was, you know, so creative to build one of the most successful startups ever, if you think he shouldn't die in prison, uh, head on over to freeross.org and uh, you can sign a petition or donate some mon money or, or, or read more about what uh, happened there because it's really a... Uh, Really sad that the the U.S. government wants this guy to die in jail for having made a website just to allow people to buy and sell things. Yeah, de definitely. I think. I mean, as you know, it, the the number of voices that's growing in uh, on behalf of the free Ross movement is it's only growing uh, within the cryptocurrency scene. Thank you so much for being such a such a uh, a vocal proponent of it. Uh, we've got a, a stable of questions for you tonight, Roger, that have a lot to do with crypto tribalism. Um, uh, obviously, Nicole reached out to you and you had met before, and she has prepared so much. Uh, part of it is an extension, I believe, of previous uh, doctoral work or preparing uh, her PhD uh, work many years ago in within uh, tribalism work and specifically having to do not with cryptocurrencies, um, but with extremely strong tribes vis-a-vis -vis religious groups. Um, and so, uh, so... I mean, hey, nowhere can you see religious fervor more obviously than in cryptocurrency, right? It was so apparent. Like, I just, I couldn't, I could not learn more. Awesome. So why don't we go ahead and jump in? Uh, is there anything that, that you, that you want to help Kurt set the record straight on before we get started? I, I gave a brief intro to you as a, or of you as our guest tonight. What did I miss? What should I have mentioned? Yeah, I think a lot of people maybe view me as some sort of Bitcoin Cash maximalist, but I've never, ever been any cryptocurrency maximalist whatsoever. So I was the first person in the entire world to start investing in Bitcoin-related startups. But then even shortly after that, uh, I put up the seed money to start Ripple. I put up the seed money to start Zcoin. I uh, helped put up this, this it wasn't the seed seed money, but it was the next stage for Zcash as well, uh, and a whole bunch of these early currencies. So like, I'm a, I'm a competition maximalist. The more things out there in the market competing with each other, the better quality products we're going to have uh, for the whole world to use. I've never, ever, ever been a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, and so I think it's really sad that there's just so much tribalism in this space today. The reason I'm such a big fan of Bitcoin Cash is because I think it's the cryptocurrency with the best chance of bringing more economic freedom to the entire world and separating money from state and, and empowering individuals to have more control over their own lives. But tomorrow, if I thought it was some other cryptocurrency, I'd be supporting that one. And uh, and I, I'm, it's not that I'm not supporting the other ones. I love, you know, Monero and Dash and Zcash and Zcoin and Ethereum is amazing. And all, the, you know, there's thousands of them out there and it's fantastic. But, uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash is just the one that I think is the closest to bring more economic freedom to the world but uh, that doesn't mean i don't support the other ones as well uh, go and give them all a try they're they're fantastic and use whatever ones are the most useful for you in your own life okay phenomenal we uh so i, I spoke to ruben yap not that long ago and and he was uh we actually didn't we didn't talk on air about uh, that initial investment but but he of course talked about it Porman and some as well or uh who is now not so much at the, the forefront of the zcoin project um but the um obviously the they're they're grateful that they that they got their project off the ground, 
Um, and clearly that involvement is it's bearing fruit now, right? In the form of brand new privacy protocols, brand new zero knowledge proofs and brand new zero knowledge protocols that never existed before. So um, proof is there for sure. That's pretty awesome. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I, without further ado, I'm going to step out of the way. Nicole has a massive list of questions that has to do very <laughs> specifically with a much more targeted direction uh, on crypto tribalism. And then um, I'm... Uh, in, in a former life, I did uh, large group training and facilitation for, for some companies uh, working in corporate America. And so I will just shamelessly jump in and I will be asking questions. So you've been warned. All right, cool. So my first question is really what the effects of crypto tribalism that you see, you know, what do you think, what kind of effects do you think that that's had on the crypto community? at large and just at on people's individual finances. Yeah, it's been it's been horrible for the whole space. I have all these people busy, you know, on infighting rather than building useful tools for the world to use and make the world a better place. And so if everybody's busy fighting and arguing with each other, they're not they're not building the tools to make, you know, the, the world a better place for everybody. And if you look at what happened with Bitcoin and and the, the tribalists are going to be mad at me for saying this because they they're going to feel like oh it's hurting their chance to, you know, buy a Lambo someday. But, you know, I was the person, I had a Lambo before Bitcoin had ever even been invented. And I sold my Lamborghini in 2012 to buy more Bitcoin. Um, but what happened is the two companies that were funding the most protocol development work, uh, Lightning Labs and Blockstream, the only products that they had in their pipeline uh, were products that would only be required if Bitcoin wasn't allowed to scale on chain. If Bitcoin were allowed to scale on chain, then you wouldn't need Lightning Network and you wouldn't need side chains or any of this other stuff. So they intentionally crippled Bitcoin to make room for their, you know, side projects in the form of side chains and lightning network. And maybe those things will work great someday. Fantastic if they do, but you shouldn't have crippled, you know, the growing ecosystem that we had. And so you had companies like Microsoft and Expedia and uh, on and on and on that used to accept Bitcoin and then stopped accepting Bitcoin when uh, Bitcoin was prevented from scaling on chain, uh, which was always the plan from day one. If you go and look at the internet archive and go back to bitcoin.org, from 2011 or 2012, they even give the math as to how Bitcoin can scale through bigger blocks to become money for the entire world. And so that's the taste of crypto politics for, for tonight. And uh, But I guess that's the, the benefit of having a decentralized number of cryptocurrencies now, because if B BTC uh, was hindered from growing to be money for the world, well, now you have Bitcoin Cash and Dash and Ethereum and Monero and Zcoin and, and you know on and on and on. The biggest regret I have in life, though, is that the overall adoption of cryptocurrency around the world was delayed by maybe half a decade or more because of that scaling civil war that went on within Bitcoin. And the fact that, you know, what Bitcoin's supposed to be censorship resistant money for the world, the small block side of the argument there uh, basically did everything they could to censor and silent, uh, silence the dissenting opinions there, the people with the different opinions. So if Bitcoin is supposed to be censorship resistant money, you shouldn't be busy engaging in censorship to protect Bitcoin's, you know, uncensorability. Uh, that's just crazy. But that's exactly what happened within the Bitcoin community. So I, I'm, uh, I'm disappointed philosophically that that was the case. Oh, it definitely so, seems like... Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I, I apologize. Definitely, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's clearly no lack of passion on your part. Clearly, you could speak about this uh, at, at length. Um, and uh, definitely appreciated that that there's there's still a voice that is sounding to the contrary, right, of, uh, of the status quo. So that's awesome. Uh, and I apologize, Nicole, you had a, a totally separate question. Um. <laughs> no, sorry. sorry. So um, I've heard you talk about... Bitcoin maximalists using the like freedom rhetoric really effectively to really talk about something that's more like censorship and control. Um, and what my question is about, have you, if you've heard the term segwit justice warrior. No, I, I haven't heard that term before, but it's a very, very fitting face. Uh, uh, term for for what went on in this space. So uh, a Segwit justice warrior. There's a lot of them out there, and it just seems a uh, it seems shocking. They feel like that there's nobody could ever possibly, in good faith, have a different opinion than those people have uh, in regards to that sort of thing. So thank you for bringing that term to my uh, to my awareness. I I hadn't heard the term, but I think I'll have to start using that in the future. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. So um yeah uh all right so part of the reason why I think. I think, I don't know, maybe there should be some background about 
part of the reason why you started to look at the bigger blocks camp um like what sort of sent you on the path to um separate from bitcoin core yes yeah, so i think that's maybe another big misconception in the public today a lot of people think that i created bitcoin cash mm -hmm. but yeah, in reality i had absolutely nothing to do with the creation of bitcoin cash Bitcoin Cash had already been in existence for, I don't know, maybe three or five months or somewhere in that ballpark uh, before I decided, okay, I'm going to have to you know, switch my effort and attention to focus on, on Bitcoin Cash. And the, the, the event that made that switch take place is there was this thing called uh, the Segwit 2X agreement. And like the, basically 99% of the ecosystem was in agreement that uh, Bitcoin was going to activate Segwit and it was going to increase the block size to two megabytes as well. And for whatever reason, they didn't do it at the same time. Uh, Segwit went first, and then a bunch of trolls came out on the internet, and then didn't uh, did, didn't do the two megabyte part of it there. So as, once the two megabyte part didn't happen, there's no way that Bitcoin can scale to be money for the entire world with one megabyte blocks. That's just absolutely ridiculous. And uh, so then I've went and focused all of my time and effort and energy on Bitcoin Cash at that point because I think it's the one that has the best chance at uh, you know bring more economic freedom to people all over the world. Another interesting turning point, though, in my view of all this is I was a big blocker at heart from the beginning, but I was watching the debates and reading and listening to what people had to say, and I, I was quiet myself. I didn't voice my opinion at all until, and what made me become vocal about this, I saw the small blockers start censoring and doing everything they could to, to delete the opinions of the big blockers. And I thought, well, wait a minute, if there's two different camps here, one side supporting free and open discussion and the other side supporting censorship and banning people and deleting posts that have a, a dissenting opinion. That's all the information I need to know right there. Strong arguments don't require censorship. If you have a strong argument, you don't need to censor your opposition. And so that's what inspired me to go out and, and speak out uh, and, and start talking about what I thought in regards to Bitcoin being able to scale uh, on chain for the world. So if, if they hadn't started their censorship campaign, I probably just would have been quiet the whole way through the debate, to be honest. Yeah, so that's kind of the answer that I've heard you give before and wanted to talk about whether or not there's been any censorship on the Bitcoin Cash Reddit or subreddit or any of the communities that are, you know. Yeah, so um, there, the RBTC, which existed before the existence of Bitcoin Cash, it was set up actually in opposition to the censorship that was going on on our Bitcoin. So I forget the exact year, maybe 2015 when the censorship started. Uh, they got rid of all the moderators on our Bitcoin on Reddit, which was the number one discussion platform in the entire world. They had more people discussing and learning about Bitcoin than pretty much every single other website combined. And then uh, the top most upvoted post right after they deleted all or got rid of all the moderators everybody knew was a thing calling, hey, in the censorship, we need free speech. And it was the most, and they asked for Thamos to step down as the moderator. That's the guy that was imposing all the censorship. It was the most upvoted post ever, I think, still to this very day on our Bitcoin. And then what happened? They locked that post and then deleted that one as well. And uh, so the censorship's been going on to this very day. And I didn't fully appreciate back then just how big of an impact that has. But if you study some of these psychological experiments that have gone on, where you have people in a room like standing up and sitting down for a bell and nobody knows why, before you know it, you can have 100 people that are standing up and sitting down for a bell and not a single one of them knows why. Uh, the same thing happened within the Bitcoin space. When they have the, the main discussion platforms are completely censored, you're only allowed to hear one opinion and everybody starts saying that. And just like every little kid around the world is taught that Santa Claus is real, they believe it. So everybody that came to Bitcoin after the censorship started heard, oh, Bitcoin can never scale on chain. Bcash is a scam. And they just heard all this nonsense and they weren't really allowed to hear anything else. And if everybody around you is saying something, you tend to believe it. And uh, that's exactly what happened within the, the Bitcoin space. And it was really uh, sad to what happened. We thought Bitcoin was censorship resistant, but uh, wow, the whole project was hijacked by a bunch of censors and, and diverted to being a completely different uh, project than was intended to be originally or described originally in, in the founding white paper that describes the project. And it was a uh, really disappointing and heartbreaking for me to see that happen. But uh, luckily there's thousands of other cryptocurrencies now for people to choose from. So because there have been contentious, there has been one contentious hard fork with Bitcoin Cash, right? I, more than one maybe, but one that I'm aware of now is the split with BSV, right? I know that you can't talk very much about that but i can't what? talk a bit more now the lawsuit's done so. oh it is okay okay good um all right all right good so 
as somebody who, even though you're not, you know, the, the face of Bitcoin Cash, you are very commonly publicly associated as the front of, you know, as, as the head of that organization or as, a, as the head of Bitcoin.com, that's a way that people know you. Yeah, perception is reality. Point. You, that you was whether... totally true of, of Bitcoin before the split ever happened. So if you looked at the face of Bitcoin in 2013, it, uh, it was me and maybe Andreas Antonopoulos. Oh, I'm not arguing that at all. I'm just I'm just wanting to acknowledge that you have some experience as somebody who's in front of the media and knows how to work the media. And I want to know if you think that there's any advantage in Craig kind of acting the way that he does with the media, even though he criticizes very many people for a very similar behavior. Yeah, I don't know. I you know, the, the Craig Wright and I guess Donald Trump both seem to think there's no uh, there's no media that's bad media. Or there's no attention that's bad attention. And I don't think I necessarily agree with that. But uh, that's been their shtick for a while now. And it, to some extent, it seems to be working out all right. So, yeah. Um, so I I think I saw a couple of months ago you were saying that Twitch was on your list of alternate social media platforms to try out. Have you experimented with it at all? Uh, it's still on my list of things to try out, so I, I haven't gotten around to it yet. But uh, from what I've seen, it looks to be a pretty interesting uh, application of, of a blockchain. And even uh, just the last uh, 48 hours or so, Twitter was preventing me from tweeting the tweet that I wanted to, to tweet, and it, it wasn't letting me do that. And uh, all the more reason maybe for me to get started on on uh, Twitch, and then we saw you know Stefan Molyneux just a couple of days ago was banned from YouTube. I think one of the you know most popular philosophy channels in the in the entire world, and uh, someone whose videos I've enjoyed a lot over the years, and now completely you know kicked off of YouTube. It's just uh, crazy. So I think we need more and more censorship resistant platforms. Uh, the question is, how do you let people that want to talk about maybe politically incorrect things have their content there, and then what do you do when people have you know snuff films or child pornography or things like that and where how do you handle that and i, I don't know what the answer to that is but I, I think i'd rather have too much free speech uh, available on the internet than not enough i'd rather err on that side yeah so there's a platform that's called note that's something that we use it's like ephemeral um and the posts disappear after 24 hours so that's kind of a cool feature and it's got free in-app stuff I said that i would bring it up yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Tell you the did. name one more time for me and everyone. It's called, who might be it's Note Note Blockchain. Note Blockchain. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look yeah. at that one as well. There are there are a few others as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't chime in and let you know that uh, that on, on the channel we recently interviewed uh, Jeremy Kaufman. You are familiar with Library uh, LBRY yeah. is their ticker symbol. Um, another they they are censorship resistant and based in New Hampshire. So as states go, they're they're a very pro first amendment and pro second amendment state and you know very very vocal in in those opinions so so they push really hard to ensure that they've built a system that they can't censor um, among others but it seems like nobody's built the uh, the the sort of feature uh the nobody's created feature parity with twitter on their protocol yet it seems well, Twitter raised, you know, how much, how much venture capital and how many millions and millions or, you know, tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars have been put into the, the Twitter platform there. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough battle, but uh, I don't know if you've seen memo.cash has come a long way and then read.cash is another interesting one. I'm, I'm really big fans of, uh, of both of those. In fact, I, I just made an investment recently in memo.cash because I thought it was so neat. Uh, it's kind of like a, a Twitter competitor, but you can also buy or sell SLP tokens permissionlessly on there. It has a lot of interesting things uh, going on over at memo.cash. We'll, we'll have to, of course, review it, check it out. And, yeah. um, and I'm curious with SLP tokens, uh, recently I read a, a press release from your team that there are proof of work, proof of work backed tokens that are now being issued. So you can essentially, I mean, by any other term or any other phrase, you might call them child chains that have their own proof of work. Is that about right? That's a good name. I haven't heard the name child chains before, but uh, yeah, Komodo says I, that with the, for theirs. So they're, yeah. they're it's been done um, differently, of course, not quite the same, but um, but that's what I'm reading is that that's now a feature that's available on BCH. Yeah, I think it was mist mist cash. I believe is the domain name for that. I know it was mist token for sure. And uh, talk about an interesting, you know, this this whole ecosystem is growing, and it's uh, it's, it feels like there's a you know Darwinian evolution of a. Uh, cryptocurrency technology uh, evolving into the world there. So the more cool stuff the world has to play with, the better in my book. Awesome. Well, I've got those those two open in a tab right now. I, 
Apologies, apologies for the interruption. I'll, I'll let Nerd, Nerd Girl get back to the questions. Here. Okay, sorry. So I this one's kind of several questions in one. And I was just wondering if I could get your thoughts on the divide within the anarchist community. And so, because this was your first year not sponsoring or attending Anarchapoco, is that right? Yeah, so um, that has nothing to do with the BSV or BCH split or anything like that. There was, and I'm still, you know, I watch a lot of the Dollar Vigilante videos. I love Jeff Berwick's videos. I'm I'm a big fan and I really enjoy that. Um, I think the old, the, the main reason actually uh, we didn't sponsor it this year is they didn't ask us to sponsor it. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan of of the message that Jeff's spreading and the Dollar Vigilante. So uh, long story short, without you know slinging too too much mud, um, there is a business disagreement with the other promoter, and I think they probably feel a little bit embarrassed uh, with the way things were handled on their side. So they didn't even ask us this year. Although I would have been willing to again, um, but. Uh, yeah, maybe that's maybe that's a topic for a whole other podcast someday. And, okay, all right, all right. But, so, uh, I'm still a fan of Anarcho Poco and uh, and uh, you know Anarchast and all that great stuff. So, okay, so I kind of have to ask a follow up question that I hope is not going too far, but I wanted to know. So, because of the divide within that community, I heard several disgruntled community members suggest the idea that cryptocurrencies have been co-opted by government or deep state agencies, placing people with ridiculous pasts and personalities in powerful positions as part of a mass psyop to destroy cryptocurrency. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Um, I think that there is some possibility that that sort of thing has gone on. I and mean, if you look at the, the, you know, what's the point of public schooling? The whole point of public schooling is so that the governments can indoctrinate people to support the government right on down the road. They want to control the media. They want to control everything. And so if you look at, you know, how, how riled up they get about, you know, anybody not participating in social security or something like that, uh, you know, the U.S. is willing to invade all sorts of countries all over the world anytime they, you know, even consider, you know, maybe not using the dollar for their trade or to sell, buy or sell their oil. Well, look at what cryptocurrency is doing. Cryptocurrency has the chance to displace the U.S. dollar from being, you know, the world reserve currency. Of course, they're going to get riled up over that. And so we know that the, the CIA was uh, asking, you know, studying Bitcoin back in 2010. They asked Gavin Andreessen to explain it to them. So if the CIA was already looking to it, into it back in 2010, I think it would be a bit naive to not think that they weren't uh, out there to make sure that the U.S. dollar continues to have the top spot in the world uh, as far as being the reserve currency thing. So, and we know for a fact, the very first video that came out uh, promoting the small block propaganda, I guess propaganda maybe isn't too strong of a word here actually, because it was paid for with government money. It was a guy that openly said he works for United States uh, intelligence agency. He's the one who funded the money and paid this guy named Peter Todd, uh, who interestingly enough showed up to the first Anarchopoco ever and then never came again, which really made me wonder what, Peter's Todd's reasons were for coming because most people that go in Anarcho Poco, they love it and they come again and again and again. Anyhow, this guy openly was paid money from a, United, a guy working for the United States Intelligence Agency to produce this film talking about how if you keep Bitcoin blocks small, Bitcoin will be decentralized. And it's the exact opposite of what the truth is. And then he was also encouraged by that same guy to implement this thing called replace by fee in Bitcoin, which basically makes Bitcoin transactions charge backable, or you can reverse the transaction up until uh, the time the transaction is included in a block. And if the blocks are full, sometimes you have several weeks to charge back your transaction. So basically this guy, at the behest of a guy working for United States Intelligence Agency, implemented a whole bunch of changes to Bitcoin that made it less useful as money and made it less likely to become you know, money for the world and displace the U.S. dollar. So I don't think it's a wild, crazy conspiracy theory one bit to think that government went out of their way to try and disrupt Bitcoin from becoming money for the world. Another example of this was the IRS came out with a ruling, I think, in 2013 or 2014. And up to that point, everybody knew Bitcoin was money. Of course, Bitcoin's money. It's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It's has coin, right, in the name. Bitcoin is money. But uh, the IRS came out with a ruling saying Bitcoin is not money. It's, it's a commodity, and you have to treat it like a property, and you have to pay capital gains tax every time you buy or sell it or use anything for it. And the system, you know, the, the set of laws that the IRS came out with would make it basically unusable as money. It would just be this commodity. And then lo and behold, you have this company, Blockstream, that raised over $100 million from traditional financial uh, businesses, uh, you know, in bed with the United States government, all using the U.S. dollar, come out with the exact same agenda. Bitcoin's not supposed to be money. It's just supposed to be, you know, a commodity or a digital asset that you can use, you know, to, to hold. 
Uh, of course, the IRS loves that. Of course, the Federal Reserve loves that. Of course, the U.S. government loves that, because if that's the case, it'll never threaten the, 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 the dominance of the U.S. dollar in the world. Okay, so what kind of tips do you think that people could, I don't know, look for to see if somebody who they're looking up to or thinking is leading them in the right direction in the space might really be, I don't know. Um, <laughs> An agent provocateur. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. The government. exactly. So a really good example for people that are familiar with a show called Free Talk Live, which is the show where I heard about Bitcoin for the first time. Freetalklive.com is the website. Um, they were talking about how, you know, undercover government agents literally were trying to infiltrate the Free State Project in New Hampshire, uh, which was a, a trying to get, you know, 20,000 libertarians to all move to New Hampshire to make it an even freer state than it is already within the United States. And they said the, the way you can spot these undercover government agents, they'll come in and they'll talk a good game. And, yeah, we taxation is theft and we need, you know, less government this and less government that. But if you talk to them, they've never read Murray Rothbard. They've never read Ludwig von Mises. They've never read Adam Smith. They've never read Frederick Bastiat. They've never actually done the reading. Maybe they know some of the names, but if they haven't ever read any of the books, but they're there super active and in there trying to do stuff, that's a pretty good sign. Because I know, you know, I wasn't born a libertarian. It was from reading Murray Rothbard and reading Ludwig von Mises and reading these guys, you know, Henry Hazlitt's of the world and all these guys, that I became a libertarian and then became an anarchist. But uh the undercover cops won't have done the readings. They won't understand, uh, you know, the, the the ideas that are in these books. Because if you haven't read it, you can't understand it. They won't. They won't. Uh, you know, they won't have read Milton Friedman. They won't have read David Friedman. They won't know who, who some of these people even are. Uh, they won't know who Lysander Spooner is. But if the people have read these books, they're almost certainly not an undercover cop. If they haven't, but they're super active within the community, I would be suspicious of them. And so I, I think that that's a good piece of advice there. Okay, great. Um, so speaking of words like libertarianism and anarchism, you kind of, was it you who kind of spearheaded the movement to adopt the term voluntarism instead of anarchism because of the negative associations? Um, I think there's a lot of people that prefer the word voluntarism or voluntarist to the word anarchist. And part of the problem is we have all these people in like Seattle and other places, you know, throwing rocks through windows and looting businesses, calling themselves anarchists. And, uh, so the, the word anarchist is, you know, there's the anarcho-capitalist, which is, you know, for people that are interested in this thing, that's the, the philosophy that I have subscribed to. But then you also have these like anarcho-communists and anarcho-syndicalists and these other guys that uh, both sides say the other side isn't a real anarchist. So maybe it's kind of like the Bitcoin cash and the Bitcoin people saying the other side's not real Bitcoin. Yeah, um, very but, much. So that's why I prefer the term voluntarist, because it's really hard to twist what the meaning of the word voluntarist is. A voluntarist is somebody who thinks that all human interactions should be on a voluntary basis or not at all. And that's uh, that's pretty hard to get twisted. So kind of why I brought this up was that I wanted to talk about the use of the term be cash and be casher and how negative that has been interpreted within the community and what you think about, you know, are some solutions for that being less triggering so that people can more closely work together? Yeah, a lot of people won't know this, but uh, and the name Bcash is just fine, or it would have been just fine. But what happened is when Bitcoin Cash split off, a bunch of these Bitcoin maximalist types that thought there should only be Bitcoin and everything else is a, a scam, they went out and registered the, you know, our Bcash on Reddit and set up the Bcash dot, you know, org or dot com domain names and set up all these Bcash blogs. And these were by people who hated Bitcoin Cash. And it was an attempt to rebrand Bitcoin Cash into Bcash because they already are controlled, you know, the Bcash Twitter account and all these different social media platforms so that they would then be able to use it to discredit Bitcoin Cash. So it was actually another online social media attack to damage Bitcoin Cash. If they hadn't gone out and registered all these people that hated Bitcoin Cash, hadn't registered all the Bcash social media names and Facebook pages and all that, then it would have been a, a pretty decent name. But the fact that they were those names were already owned and controlled by people who hate Bitcoin Cash, of course we can't let Bitcoin Cash be renamed into a name that's controlled by all the people who hate Bitcoin Cash. So a lot of people, uh, you can Google, there's an essay by Yonald Football called uh, Why Some People Call Bitcoin Cash Bcash Will Be Shocking or, or something like that. And it's a fantastic essay where he documents and, and links to the different websites and shows exactly uh, what went on in regards to that. But so my question is, 
So moving forward, there's probably very few people who are just now adopting Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash who are going to be familiar with that story or willing to go look that, you know, that far back. They just want to know, like, why can't we use this term or why can we use this term? I'm wondering kind of where I've heard a few different sides of this debate and I'm kind of wondering where you fall on there. I think people can call things whatever they want. Um, <laughs> In my book, Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin Cash, and Bcash was part of a social media attack. Uh, and the fact that you see, I'm literally, you know, Adam Back, the CEO of Blockstream, the company that literally blocked the stream of blocks and blocked Bitcoin from being adoptable as money around the world, uh, because the only product that their business had depended on Bitcoin being, you know, strangled. Uh, he literally is out there on Twitter, and he hates Bitcoin Cash. He's literally on there telling other people, make sure you call it Bcash every chance you get. He's telling people, but you didn't call it Bcash. He's complaining when they don't call it Bitcoin or Bcash. So, like, uh, the fact that all the people that despise and hate Bitcoin Cash want to call it Bcash all the time is probably a pretty good sign that that's not something the people who, that like Bitcoin Cash should be calling it. Okay. All right. So, I guess that, that's just that's what you do to point to some – if someone who was new – was asking about that term, that's what you would do, it would be point them to that kind of research. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably point them to Yonald's essay on exactly that topic where he cites it. You, re you read the links and the effort that these people went to to try and change the name of Bitcoin Cash to Bcash and then discredit Bcash. It would be really shocking. There's some stories about um, Bitcoin Core also really in influencing negatively the price of cryptocurrencies. And I actually kind of saw it happening at one point, like, uh, you know, writing in crypto media where I actually kind of saw the way that things were moving around. Um, and I'm curious about what you think about crypto media right now. It seems that there's more crypto media than ever before. So that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I, I think the fact that Twitter and YouTube that were busy censoring stuff, that's a bad thing. So we need to see more people using library and using memo.cash and Twitch and all these uncensorable platforms. The more the more options people have, the better. And uh, yeah, we're just getting started. It's still early days in this whole wide new world of uh, decentralized technologies. Alternate social media platforms are very, very important right now. So um, let's see. While you're looking up that next question, let me go ahead yeah. and riff on this just a little bit because you're no stranger to some of the trends in technology. You, I'm sure, used BitTorrent when it was shiny and new, and it's still performant and functional today. Um, and there are a lot of media platforms that are based on it as opposed to blockchain-first or blockchain-only solutions. Uh, one of those that's really popular is BitChute. We don't really promote it. We haven't really tried it. But there are platforms like that that use WebTorrent to serve the media in a decentralized fashion, but completely decoupled from blockchain or even cryptocurrency. What do you think about that as far as performance versus uncensorability um, via the decentralized nature of blockchain specifically? Do we have to yeah. be hung up on it being blockchain? Not at all. I'm I'm a fan of anything that works, and whether it's blockchain or BitTorrents or you know IPFS or something else or Tor, or, you know, take your pick. I'm a utilitarian maximalist. There, right? The more useful something is, the more people are going to use it. So, uh, uh, yeah, whatever works in my book is just fine. Awesome. Okay, so um, did you have any kind of like religious upbringing? I mean, I realize that you kind of separated yourself from that, but it's kind of important because of my question about Bitcoin Jesus that we know a little bit about your upbringing. Yeah, um, I definitely had a real religious uh, upbringing. Uh, the Christian school talked about evolution, not evolution, but evolution. And it was this trick to make you think that, you know, God didn't exist and the whole world was supposed to be, you know, 10,000 years old. And they thought that, you know, God created everything. And, uh, but then they, they mentioned a couple of things. Oh, but by the way, God forgot to do this, this, and this. And so that's why the earth is only 10,000 years old. And I thought, wait a minute, God's all powerful, all knowing, he can do whatever he wants. And they said they created the universe with the appearance of age, but he forgot to make a couple of things look so old. So I thought, if God knows everything and can do everything, how is he going to forget something? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then, so that set me down the path to questioning it. And then I came across a, a book called uh, Atheism, the Case Against God by George E. Smith, I think. And as I was reading it, I really felt like maybe this guy is a libertarian as well. But the book was so convincing. And then it wasn't until later on I found out he was a 
a big giant, you know, free market libertarian uh, guy. And there's a really interesting debate between him and David Friedman that took uh, place at one of the early pork fests in New Hampshire. And uh, anyhow, after having read that book, I, I felt uh, kind of embarrassed for ever having believed in any of that sort of stuff. So sorry to any religious people out there I'm offending, but go and pick up the book, Atheism, the Case Against God. Uh, if you're not willing to challenge your beliefs, uh, your beliefs uh, are unfounded in, in evidence. So go and uh, go and pick up that book and uh, keep an open mind. Well, it's hey, funny you should true. mention that, the, uh, the the New Testament. Tell, if people are come from the Judeo-Christian uh, background, the New, New Testament, Testament also crazy. tells them, if I, give well, every man a reason for the faith that's in you. You need to read yeah. So I guess my next question is related to your sort of personal branding as Bitcoin Jesus. And I know that you've said that you didn't choose that name. It was sort of given to you. Um, I was just wondering how early you were aware that your, I don't know, not your brand of Bitcoin, but the brand of Bitcoin that is associated with you would also be the second one, you know, the- The, the second, second coming? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm curious if you were aware of the correlation. I, I, I hadn't thought of that until just now, but yeah, I guess Bitcoin Cash is the second coming of uh, this, the savior for the world's, you know, ability to have economic freedom and economic sovereignty for each individual around the world. So maybe I'll have to figure out a clever marketing play on, on that front. <laughs> I don't know if that would be a great one or not, honestly. It, that might be really frightening for a lot of people. Maybe it's the mark of the beast, right? You never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, all right. I only have one more question and um, it's really how you think, how are you feeling about your relationship with kind of BSV community members who aren't really fond of leadership? And I'm asking this because I've had conversations with people over there who told me like they saw you somewhere and were afraid to say hello. And I thought that that was really sad statement about the state of crypto tribalism. And I wanted to talk to you about it. Yeah, I have zero problem with BSV. I like a lot of the rhetoric that they're talking about building like a stable platform for businesses to build on top of. Uh, so like that, I love the part that they say, oh, BSV needs to be government compliant on everything and not enable anything illegal. That's just nonsense. You've missed the whole point of cryptocurrency. If you think it's not supposed to be able to be usable for things that are also illegal, uh, if, if you don't care about that, then just go back to using PayPal or your bank account. Um, the whole point of it is that, you know, uncensorable money means that People are able to break the law with that uncensorable money. But uh, if if you're a BSV fan, like come and talk to me. That's fine. If you're a BTC fan, if you're if you're a Dogecoin fan, come talk to me. Like I'm I'm a, I'm I'm not a maximalist about it. I'm a utilitarian maximalist. If BSV is useful to people, fantastic. Uh, I have no problem with that one bit. Uh, I think the big shortcoming of BSV at this point uh, isn't in the technology. It's in the fact that Craig and Calvin went and sued everybody all over the world and basically burnt all these bridges. So you don't have BSV listed on any exchanges. You don't have it on, uh, you know, BitPay. You don't have it on Go Crypto. It's not on any of these platforms that enable people to actually use it. Uh, I think they have their, you know, hand cash wallet and Twitch, and that's all that I'm really aware of. But I'm not deep in that community either. But uh, man, Craig and Calvin suing everybody sure didn't help BSV one bit. So. Well, yeah, I think it also probably hindered, you know, uh, sorry, investment money era. Uh, sorry investor capital, right? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I ask also just to modify that question, the tiniest bit, what's your response when we replace any of those projects with say Litecoin, uh, where there's a bit more legacy and a, a bit more history there of working very closely with Blockstream and, and with some of the actors that are, that, that were part of keeping blocks small in Bitcoin. Yeah. I'm, I'm just stunned. So many people were fooled by Charlie Lee. So Charlie Lee, for those that don't know, is the creator of Litecoin. And he said openly that if the blocks on Litecoin ever became full, he would just increase the block size on Litecoin. And he was one of the biggest cheerleaders for limiting the block size on Bitcoin. But if you limit the block size on Bitcoin, that creates a need for Litecoin, right? Because if Bitcoin transactions are slow, expensive, and unreliable because of full blocks, what's the next best alternative? Litecoin's right there ready to pick up the slack. So just like Blockstream needed the blocks to be crippled on Bitcoin, just like uh, Lightning Labs needs the block size to be crippled on Bitcoin, 
Litecoin needs the blocks to be crippled on Bitcoin for Litecoin to even have a use case. If the block size isn't crippled on Bitcoin, nobody needs Litecoin. Nobody cares about it whatsoever. So I'm stunned. So many people were fooled by Charlie Lee saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I support Bitcoin. Let's just keep the block size small and everybody can use Litecoin instead. That was just him seeking out his own self-interest. Uh, he has almost zero understanding of the economics uh, that made Bitcoin popular to begin with or economics in general. You can find a video of him, a speech that he gave. Uh, on some blockchain cruise in the Mediterranean a year or two ago, where he literally gets up on stage. He didn't know the name because he hasn't done the economics reading, but he was literally espousing uh, Karl Marx's labor theory of value as to why Bitcoins have value. He said, you have to spend you know thousands of dollars worth of effort to produce a Bitcoin, so that's why they're worth thousands of dollars. And like uh, it was just embarrassing for me to watch him there. I felt bad for him because he's up there. For anybody that's you know read Karl Marx or read you know Austrian economics, you realize that he has zero clue what he's talking about and then the two of us made a bet i don't know about uh, almost two years ago now in regards to lightning network having more than uh, i think it was a thousand merchants was the bet he clearly lost the bet the, the winner of the bet was supposed to buy the other person a t-shirt um i want to buy him the t-shirt and we they were supposed to have a talk he won't ex he won't give me his address to send him the t-shirt but he won't send me my t-shirt because he knows he didn't win and he's just avoiding the whole fact that we had that debate so uh, okay so so he's uh yeah. so he's a bit bit of a fraud and, and a welcher on to, to boot okay yeah. <laughs> so that's, always, that's what strong, you're saying but, uh, i think he's just doesn't understand and he doesn't understand the fact that he doesn't understand and then he's dishonest in regards to our, our bet in regards to the lightning network that that is uh, really disappointing as well his brother bobby i love but bobby's such a nice guy bobby lee's fantastic uh charlie lee i feel is a, a bit of a weasel in regards to our, our uh, lightning network bet because uh charlie if you think you won send me my t-shirt and we can have a talk about it online and see us you know present your case as to why you think you won and uh i know very clearly why i think i won and i have a bitcoin cash t-shirt for ready for you charlie if you happen to hear this Awesome. Can I follow up just on, on that? Just just a tiny yeah, bit. And I'm not I'm not uh, those who who follow my content know I'm not this big like Litecoin maximalist, and I don't have any real interest in uh, in being contrarian right now. But just to uh, to make the case, uh, I've heard it said that Litecoin is can be likened sort of to a test net for Bitcoin. And you mentioned Bobby. Uh, Bobby clearly has an interest in Bitcoin development as well. Uh, what do you make of there, that potentially being a way in which, you know, uh, soft balls are thrown at uh, Blockstream's work while Litecoin takes the fast pitches? Um, so, such as, for example, privacy protocols like Mimblewimble uh, being implemented there first and tried out. I'm not aware of Mimblewimble being implemented on Litecoin at this point, but, uh, uh, you know, I have no problem with Litecoin. I think Litecoin not by intentional design so much of, of Charlie, but just by kind of dumb luck to some extent, uh, provides a better user experience than, than Bitcoin it is at this point. Litecoin transactions are faster, cheaper, more reliable than Bitcoin transactions. That's just a, a open fact. Uh, the problem with it is that if you go to the average Joe on the street and say, have you heard of Litecoin? They'll say, no, what's that? Whereas if you say, have you heard of Bitcoin? They'll say, yeah, I've heard of that. And so the, the network effect you know, is, is a big, big deal. And Litecoin doesn't have that big network effect. Okay. So uh, again, uh, I guess I, maybe I should rephrase the question then. As far as Litecoin, the potential use case for Litecoin being much more of a technical one, uh, being a bit of a, a technical uh, testing bed and test net uh, in preparation for technologies to maybe be implemented on Bitcoin in the future. And and, and I apologize. I didn't mean to, to I didn't mean to insinuate that Mimblewimble was being implemented on Litecoin, but just that that's the those are the open talks that are being had by developers that they are interested in trying it. And so there are improvement proposals being made to potentially try Mimblewimble on Litecoin. Um, I don't know. What do you think of it as that that test, that use case? Does that feel, make sense? Does it seem far-fetched? I think feel free, but you know, Bitcoin already has its own testnet. I think they might even have more than one testnet, uh, actually. So if you want to try it on, on Litecoin that has you know a market cap of a couple of billion dollars, I guess that's fine before you try it on a coin with a market cap of you know $170 billion. But... Uh, you know, feel feel free. I, I don't own any Litecoin, so uh, I don't have really have a direct dog in that fight. But uh, feel, feel free. I have no problem with that at all. And you know, the more things, the more experiments people try, and the more tests and test nets, that's great. Well, thank you for playing. I, yeah, I just wanted to ask that that question. It seemed like a, a good time to ask it. Sure. So sorry. I oh, you know what? I've wanted to ask you this for a while because of. Just a joke paper that I wrote. Do you happen to know what your Myers-Briggs type indicator is? 
Yeah, it's whatever the most standard libertarian was, INTGF or something. I, I forget. I'd have to Google, but it's the one that like 90% of libertarians are. Okay. I'm not sure which one that is, but. INTJ, does that sound right? I, I think. INTJ right. is mm. one, but I don't know if that's which one. I'll look it up later. Thank okay. you. I've, I've got, I've got yours open right now, Nicole. Do I, do I do the reveal? Do you want to wait till you're in more private environs? No, you can tell <laughs> what it is. You can tell what it is. So, um, so Nicole did a write up. Uh, it was April last year, right? Mm-hmm. She did a write up, uh, guessing, doing her, her best educated guess as to what your personality type would be, um, using the, the MBTI. She says you're an ISFP. Probably. Definitely was not that one. Sorry. <laughs> I was wrong. All right. Cool. Well, I've got a couple of them right. So Let's can't see. win them all. Yeah. All right. <laughs> can't get them all. All right. Um, so maybe one last thing that uh, I can show everybody too that uh, I have, I carry around in my wallet here. I have some, you know, traditional people recognize these type of things, but I also have something that's only possible on a chain where the blocks are not full. So I give these out as tips. This is a paper wallet. And the first person watching the live stream that scans this with the Bitcoin.com wallet gets 50 Eastern Caribbean dollars, which is about, I don't know, 13 US dollars or something like that. Uh, and so that's literally a private key that's on this. So I'll hand these out to people as tips. Uh, whenever I, I give them some normal money as well, so they don't feel like I'm cheating them, but I give them uh, some Bitcoin cash as well. In fact, uh, I gave some to the delivery driver uh, yesterday and then this morning I woke up and he was texting me, hey, how do I use this? This is really neat. Thank you for that. So it's a, it's a great way to spread it. And if you want to spread this to you know, trick-or-treaters or tipping people, you can make your own and print these up over at gifts.bitcoin.com. It's a really fantastic example of how you can spread cryptocurrency. And the really neat part about it is bitcoin.com never has custody of your funds. We don't have the private keys. Um, but what we do do is we keep a signed transaction for the money to send it back to your own address that you specify after whatever time period you specify. So for example, if nobody managed to claim this one that I just held up here for everybody to see, if nobody claims it by uh, August 17th, right, 30 days from the time I made this, the money bounces right back to my wallet uh, automatically. But Bitcoin.com never has custody of the funds in any way whatsoever. They just broadcast the signed transaction to the network. And if somebody already claimed it, that uh, signed transaction is invalid. If nobody claimed it, then it's valid and the money comes back to me. So it's a great way to give Bitcoin cash to trick or treaters or tips or anybody. And nobody, the people that don't claim it, well, the money comes back to you. So uh, people, I invite you to check it out at the uh, gifts.bitcoin.com. And that's only possible on blockchains uh, that don't have full blocks because on Bitcoin, you can't do that any longer because the fees are too high. That's pretty darn cool. I mean, <laughs> you got that out with plenty of time for Halloween and you even, you even gave a, a reasonable yeah. use case. I think that one's going to stick. Yeah. I can't wait for the trick-or-treaters to come this next year. They're all going to get some Bitcoin cash. <laughs> That'll be funny. I wonder how they'll receive that. They'll get candy too. So I, th I think they'll be okay with it. So. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah. Uh, set. Okay. I do have one question. It's about the first followers of Bitcoin. And I'm curious about if you have any suggestions for who maybe, because I am kind of working on a theory that, that further followers emulate the first follower instead of the, you know, founder of a project. So I'm wondering if you have any guesses or leads as to who the first follower of Bitcoin would be. I guess uh, Hal Finney was probably the first follower. I mean, if Satoshi was first, Hal Finney came along second. Um, I'd probably have to give some more thought to that question because I, even when it was Hal Finney, there were, very, very few people uh, involved in the project at that point. So, Yeah, so that's kind of my concern with looking at how Finney as that person is the, you know, potential for his involvement in Satoshi, right? It's like, that's kind of a really prevalent theory. So I've, I've talked to Hal's wife, um, who's still alive. And, and to be honest, you know, maybe Hal's going to come back for round two. A lot of people don't realize it. He's right. in uh, chronic suspension storage with a company called Alcor, ALCOR.org, a company based down in Arizona. And that was part of when I just really knew just how perfect the Bitcoin community was for me back then, because Alcor, the chronic suspension company, was a company that I had signed up for myself when I was like 19 or 20 years old. Uh, so I'd been, I'd been an Alcor member for like 20 years now at this point. And so the second person to ever do a Bitcoin transaction 
uh, was also signed up for the exact same service that I signed up for. And then I even managed to get them to accept Bitcoin back in like 2012 or 13. And then I got them to accept Bitcoin Cash more recently. So I've been paying all of my dues to Alcor in Bitcoin Cash most recently as well. So if uh, if you think dying is, uh, is you know, not an optimal outcome, go and look into signing up for a chronic suspension. You can pay for things with cryptocurrency over there at Alcor.org. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that how funny is cryogenically frozen. I think I was just telling someone that a couple of weeks ago. And that there is a whole community within cryptocurrency that really believes that how funny is Jesus. I don't know about Jesus, but... No, uh, I'm telling you, it exists. Okay. Another interesting tie into all that, too. So I was... Uh, in my late teens or early 20s, I was going to these Alcor meetups that they had in Silicon Valley when I lived there. And one of the people that I met there was a man named uh, Ralph Merkel. And uh, people may recognize that last name of Merkel is in the Merkel trees that are used in Bitcoin itself. And so the Ralph Merkel was the inventor of Merkel trees, and he was so nice to me. And I talked to him for, you know, all day extensively there and he was just such an interesting fascinating guy and it was so nice to you know make lots of time for me it's just i was probably 19 years old at that point but uh really interesting just kind of all these different tie-ins that uh fit uh within the cryptocurrency community and another guy that i met also probably 20 years ago when i was you know this is maybe around the year 2000 or so 2001 uh, is david schwartz the, the basically the the cto of ripple and the guy who actually did all the coding uh, to create Ripple. I, I met him at an artificial intelligence conference back, you know, 20 years ago, long before any cryptocurrency stuff. It was just kind of really interesting just uh, how life kind of comes full circle in, in that sense. Yep. All right, Seth, I know that you have some more questions. I do. I have just a few. And Roger, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Just really appreciate you being willing to do this live first off. I know you're, you're not no stranger to this, but, uh, but you pretty much came sight unseen. It's like, Oh, cool. Nicole invited me onto some live stream with some third party. We'll see what happens. Nicole was convincing. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still it, it takes a, it, it takes a, a player of rare caliber to take a slide tackle, get up and, you know, keep on scoring. So thank you. Appreciate that. A uh, couple questions are just, I mean, I know a lot of the interviews that people ask you to to jump into, they circle very heavily around the tech, right? Everybody wants to know, well, why big blocks? Why small blocks? Hey, were you being censored? And we asked some of those questions as well. And then some of the tech you've even mentioned on a couple of occasions now, even brought yourself to to admit we live in a world where the tech is we need a lot more. The work is far from done. There's there's a lot of diversity needed, a lot of diversity of thought needed, a lot of new approaches needed before any of this stuff gets secure enough or hits the balance that may be required uh, for it to achieve the the critical mass that maybe you hoped for earlier on in, in your career yeah. uh, within this within this space. You'll pardon me for being a little more fascinated by asking you questions that have to do with you. Um, you mentioned that you were raised somewhat religious. Where did you grow up? I, I grew up in Silicon Valley, but, uh, you know, I remember having a discussion with my mother at one point, once I was stopping to believe in all that sort of stuff. And, uh, I told her, I said, do you honestly, cause they were taught, you know, the Bible is the literal word of God. Everything in the Bible is absolute truth. And I said, do you honestly believe in talking snakes? Do you think snakes can talk to people, right? For people that don't know in the, in, in Genesis and Adam and Eve in the garden, of Eden, there's this talking snake that tells them to eat the fruit. Right. And I asked mom, do you honestly believe in talking snakes? And she wouldn't answer the question. Her reply was, Oh, shut up. Right. And she wouldn't talk about it. And, I, and, 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 you know, watching the evasiveness there, you know, was another sign that that guy shouldn't be believing in nonsense. If people aren't willing to stand by their conviction and say, yes, I think snakes can talk and they can convince people to eat fruit. And if you eat the fruit, then suddenly you know everything. Like what a bunch of nonsense. But, you know, if people are taught it from, from the time they're born, they tend to believe it until they're willing to, you know, think outside the box there. And uh, sure. it's hard for some people to do. Sure. Okay. So it sounds like then it was, yeah, very, very, uh, fairly strict upbringing though, but you, uh, you got your answer in your mom's silence. You mentioned growing up in Silicon Valley. So Northern California for most of your childhood and most of your formative years. Yeah. All, all the way up until I was 26 and then I moved to Japan. So got it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I saw a couple of your videos and they're, they're posted on your personal channel of your earlier Nogi and your, your earlier jujitsu, uh, matches that, Clearly, your coach has a Japanese accent for those matches that are here stateside, and then clearly you've rolled in Japan. What happened there? What's kind of the history? Like, do you still roll? Do you still practice Japanese style, Brazilian? 
Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Are you a Jiu Jitsu guy as well, or? Uh, well, you know, I never, I never show my cars. I've got a brother who's a purple belt at in the Gracie School, and and I, I've, I trained a little bit with Ricky Lundell, the the youngest American Gracie black belt. But okay, yeah, but you know, I don't, I don't want to. Don't um, show all your cars. Okay. You, maybe we'll have the chance to roll someday. But yeah, I've been training a little over ten years. I'm a brown belt with a one stripe, and uh, the coronavirus has slowed down the training a bit, but. Uh, I like to roll as much as I can. And when uh, I wasn't as busy with the cryptocurrency stuff, I was competing as much as I, I could. So I won a bunch of tournaments at uh, Blue and Purple Belt and uh, haven't had a chance to compete yet at Brown Belt, but I can't wait. Uh, I, I love it. It's addicting. As anybody who's you know done it, uh, it's really an addicting hobby and uh, it's fun. So yeah. try it. If you want. Very, very cool. I just haven't seen anything uh, anything with you publicly that would indicate that you're still extremely actively involved. And maybe that's just my ignorance, but I, I looked at a couple of things that were dated. So Yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm still, every chance uh, I can get, I, I've been training, although the, the coronavirus has slowed that down a bit. But uh, when 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 it's possible, I'll train, you know, six days a week. So Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, you mentioned moving to Japan in 2000, uh, well, when you were 26. 2006, yeah. Okay. So when you were 26, you moved to Japan. And what kind of what governed that decision? Why Japan of all places in the world? I mean, because it sounds like you had undergone a couple of massive ideological changes, and that they they clearly affected your worldview. I mean, I doubt like you didn't go like disown your family or whatever. Like, oh, mom, you lied to me my whole life, so I'm out of here. I mean, what did that shift look like for you? Clearly, your world was rocked. Obviously, um, how did that shift happen? And then why Japan? Yeah. So what? Um what really rocked my world was going to prison in the United States. I was brought up being taught the whole time that America is the land of the free and you have free speech and you can say what you think and you, you, you know, won't get in trouble for, for expressing ideas that even if other people disagree with them. And I found out that that was a pack of lies. Uh, it, you better watch out. Like, you know, I was Voltaire or somebody said, you know, if you want to know who rules over you, look at who you can't criticize. And I found out real quick, you know, when you criticize the federal government, they come after you. And just look at what they've done for Julian Assange, right? There's another example, or Edward Snowden, or anybody out there that criticizes them. And so my world got turned upside down, uh, wound up doing 10 months in federal prison for uh, selling firecrackers on eBay without a license back when eBay had a guns and ammo section. And there were tons of other dealers selling the exact same product online. Cabela's Sporting Goods was selling it. Uh, it wasn't any issue whatsoever, unless you were also criticizing the ATF and FBI at the same time. Then it was a giant problem. They wanted to send you to jail over it. Uh, so even while I was in prison, the company I'd been buying those from was still selling the exact same product without a license. Uh, so anyhow, got out, knew I didn't ever want to live in the U.S. ever again because I'd been treated so unfairly. And uh, I had had one Japanese girlfriend previously. Um, it was a good experience. I figured, okay, I'll give Japan a try. But if I'd had a Brazilian girlfriend, I would have wound up in Brazil, and I'd probably already be a black belt by now. Um, okay. But uh, it's just kind of by chance. But it turned out Japan's a you know a great place, and I really uh, enjoyed my time there. Although recently, I've been spending most of my time in the Caribbean. Got it. Okay. So is it is it overly? Uh, am I am I reducing this too much to say then you you uh, you moved for love? Uh, yeah, that's too much of a reduction. I think so. <laughs> okay. I, was my, I was 26. I was still, you know, my, uh, you know, girl chasing days, I suppose at that point. So, okay. So you liked your prospects then, uh, you, you, you liked the, the, game. the opportunities seemed good in Japan at that point. Awesome. And, uh, as far as like, sort of like personal life, you, at, at this point still, you're fairly unattached, not married, no kids, et cetera. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm not putting a value judgment. Yeah, uh, I, 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 going out there and enjoying every single day of my life uh, to the max. So that's great. I, and I've heard also, I think Nicole had mentioned that when you're not living in Japan, that you split your time between Japan as your, your primary place of residence and then somewhere else. Where is that? Yeah. Most recently I've been spending a bunch of time in St. Kitts uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, and so I'm in the Caribbean right now, but not in St. Kitts, but uh, for, for security reasons, I don't always say exactly where I'm at it's until sure. after I've left. So. Sure. That makes perfect sense. Uh, as far as the, the sort of the, the cultural experience that you've had between St. Kitts or other areas uh, of the Caribbean and, and other areas of the world that you're, that you're comfortable with um, versus Japan, culturally, how do you feel like this helps you or do you feel like it helps you at all with a bit of your personal mission? Because what I'm hearing consistently as a through line is uh, really more championing the cause of voluntarism and yeah. the currency not so much that it's entirely secondary, but it is kind of secondary in the service of that mission. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Nope, you got it exactly right. So the cryptocurrency to me is the tool 
to advocate for voluntarism around the world. So the more voluntarism in the world, the happier I am, the faster the rate of economic growth is going to be, the better off everybody is. Uh, I think that's the way the world should work. And I see cryptocurrency as the tool to enable and bring voluntarism to the world and, you know, take away the power from the state to control peaceful people. And that that's uh, what an exciting tool to have available to us. So that's why I've been promoting cryptocurrencies exactly for the reason that you uh, grasp there. It's, it's, it's to promote voluntarism. And then one other thing, if I can add to that, though, too, that I found helpful, maybe, is so I, I, I speak, I, I still have an accent, but I speak fluent Japanese, right? So, and even, you know, if I'm spending a lot of time in Japan, I'll find myself thinking in Japanese rather than in English, even when I'm by myself. And speak in Japanese, the, the grammar and the word structure and the, the, the way of thinking is very different than in English. And I really like the fact that that's able to help me see the world a bit more differently because you have two different sets of ways to think and look at the world. And uh, I guess one kind of fun example of this or a really nice example I, I really like. So in the U.S., you'll see signs that say, no smoking, $500 fine or something. It's just very direct. And there was a sign um, in Japan, and my best attempt to translate what it says into English, the sign says, uh, from good manners come the rules. So follow the rules to have good manners. No smoking. And I thought that was a much, much, much better way of having a no, a no smoking sign than they do in the U.S. And I, I really like that. And there's lots of things in Japanese that it's just the, uh, a very different and less direct way of, uh, of thinking about things than in English. So just okay. a little insight there into the, the world of the Japanese language. Okay. Now I, I gathered as much because just listening to some videos of yours from, uh, from, I guess over 11 years ago, you were already quite conversational. You were, you were quite, quite good with your Japanese. Um, and, Pardon my ignorance. Relatively speaking, I don't know that much about Japanese culture. I've only studied a little bit from the Tokugawa, uh, the Meiji Restoration, because right? it's interesting, right? So a lot's been written about it. Um, Meiji Restoration Forward. Um, and yeah, Japanese culture is fascinating to me. I'm just wondering, do you feel like living in Japan or do you feel like Japanese culture that it informs your ability to champion voluntarism? Inside Japan, I, th I think it does. And so another interesting story in the early days of me getting excited about Bitcoin, this was probably early 2012. There was a, a Japanese friend of mine that had lived in America for a long time, and she was working as like an English teacher in Japan to teach Japanese people English. And so she invited me to meet up with her and one of her students one night, uh, right around Christmas time of 2011. And then I told her student. Let me tell you about, I told both of them, I said, let me tell you about Bitcoin. Let me show you how this works. And I spent the whole evening telling about Bitcoin. And she was embarrassed that I was like, you know, telling her student so much about Bitcoin and felt like I was bothering her student about it, but her student loved it. And so that her student, a lot of people, if you're in crypto right now, you might've heard of Miss Bitcoin Japan, my Fujimoto. And so that was the student. Now she's done a huge amount of promoting Bitcoin in Japan, but she, another you know, back in 2012, another really interesting example of this, she said, I want you to meet my boss. She was working for this company uh, in Japan at that point. She said, I think you would really like my boss. And her boss didn't really speak any English. But when we showed up to meet her boss, he was waiting for us at a cafe and he was reading a book. And I asked, you know, what, what book are you, you reading, right? And like this girl, you know, Mai didn't know anything about, uh, you know, voluntarism really or, or that I was so into that sort of thing. But her boss was sitting there reading The Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard, translated into Japanese, of course. And uh, I thought, wow, you you were right. I'm, I'm going to get along just fine with your boss. And so that guy turned out to be a, a great guy as well. So, uh, But being a foreigner in Japan who speaks Japanese very well, uh, you get a bit more attention and people will listen to you a bit more otherwise. And then uh, the fact that you know I'm the you know founder of bitcoin.com and the first person in the world to start investing in this ecosystem and the startups there uh that helps as well so i've definitely uh done uh, a lot and in fact for those that are familiar with the uh essay i pencil by leonard reed i believe uh it's a fantastic fantastic essay if you haven't read it or you're not familiar with it read uh, this essay called i pencil and it talks about how there's not a single person alive in the planet that knows how to make up something as simple as a pencil and at first that sounds crazy but he goes through it and he talks about well 
to get the yellow paint, you have to, you know, dig something else out of the ground. And to get the lead or the graphite, you dig something else and you chop down a tree and you need chainsaws to do that. And then the chainsaws run on gasoline and you have to pump oil out of the ground somewhere else to make your to refine into gasoline. And he goes through this whole complicated story. And by the end of that, you realize, my God, you're right. There's not a single person alive on the planet that knows how to make something as simple as a pencil. And for one of these Japanese crypto websites, I went over all of that and talked about how prices are so important because prices transmit the information as to what a pencil should be made of or what an iPhone should be made of or what anything should be made out of whatever other goods. And if you have price controls or you block the flow of money, you're blocking that information, right? And so if you block the information, then people aren't going to be able to make things as efficiently as they otherwise would have been able to. And I got to explain this all in a bit of uh, more detail. And they published this all on their Japanese you know, news website. And they said it was a by far the most read article ever they had ever posted out of all the cryptocurrency articles they'd ever posted on that. And we went into voluntarism quite a bit in that interview as well. So it was really fun to have that sort of platform. And I think to a large extent though, like Japanese, there's a bit of a, there's a huge amount of conformity within the country, but there's also a huge amount of like, you conform because you want to, not because you're forced to so much. And so that's kind of nice. Um, but, but the fact that you're expected to conform all the time is also not so nice, so, sure. but it's, it's interesting. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what, uh, that, that's kind of what brought up that question for me. It seems like a very enig enigmatic choice for, for somebody who is, uh, you know, and, an, and, and cap turned voluntarist, um, and attempting to champion will win more hearts and minds. It seems like, sure. It's probably a really great missionary field for, for, for winning hearts and minds, um, depending on your approach. Uh, but I wonder, how has your experience been in Japan versus other areas of the world that you frequent? Either you have a second residence in or that you visit frequently. Um, do you feel like the message of voluntarism, that it falls on deaf ears under certain circumstances uh, within Japan? Do you feel like the culture there is helping you to amplify that because of that sort of well-mannered society? Um, and then I the other areas of the world, like what's the, what's the contrast there? I think it just depends, right? It depends on the person. There's lots of different individuals. Yeah, and you never know. You might meet a Japanese guy that's reading Murray Rothbard while he's waiting for you to show up. And then you might meet some other guy that that you know wants the government to run and control everything. So it just it just really depends on the person. Uh okay. Yeah. Uh what's your take on the uh the Bank of Japan, the National Bank of Japan owning what was it upwards of eighty percent of all commodities there? I think eighty two percent. Japan's headed for a rough, rough time. Everybody's getting older. The government's, you know, trying to control everything. So uh, I, I don't know if that's the right place to be long term. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like maybe if you can position Bitcoin Cash correctly, you've got your escape hatch. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for indulging me. I really appreciate that. Uh, this is, you know, it's a rare opportunity. And do people often ask you about this sort of stuff? Your a, a bit more of your your background, your upbringing. No, I know occasionally, but not, not, not too often. Yeah. Well, not, not too often. So thank you for that. The, the jujitsu stuff, like, I think it's boring for most people, but I'm happy to talk about it, you know, all day long. I, I can't oh, wait yeah. to you know, have some training partners available again here soon as well. So. For sure. Well, Gracie combat is supposed to be entirely self-directed at home, right? So it's yeah. <laughs> supposed to be R rolling, rolling with other people is, uh, is definitely, uh, you know, important as well, I think. So. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, thank you for that. Nicole, I know you had uh, some uh, some additional questions that we haven't touched on yet. And I have one or two more that are kind of more about the tech, just a little bit. Um, not much, but again, really appreciate your time and don't want to don't wanna ask you to overstay our welcome. We we can go. I, I have 40% left on the laptop battery. So I'll tell you when it gets too low to and we have to call it in because I don't have it plugged in at the moment. So okay. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I think that I really asked most of my questions for now because now I have to go back and think about them. Um, yeah, so Seth, go ahead. And then I think, I don't know, we're live, right? Has anybody asked questions? Why don't we give away some more Bitcoin Cash if we're live, right? So I have another 50 Eastern Caribbean dollar ticket right here. I'm pulling out of my wallet for the giveaway here. All you need for it is the Bitcoin.com wallet or any wallet that can scan a private key. And so the first person that scans this on the live stream will get 50 Eastern Caribbean dollars, which is about, I don't know, 13 or 14 US dollars or something like that. So here we go. So the first person to scan that. And again, I made these at gifts.bitcoin.com. You can make these as well. You can even send them right there by, by email. Uh, so if you want to email somebody that's never used cryptocurrency ever before, 
you can send these to them by email. And if they don't bother to claim it within 30 days, the money comes back to you. So it's such a fantastic way to spread cryptocurrency adoption uh, to people around the world. So there you go. Awesome. We went and made you full screen there. So that, that QR code is nice and clear. Thank you. So awesome. Somebody's going to surely take you up on that. Do you have the Block Explorer open in another window right now? Maybe. Well, here I can check because <laughs> I have my phone. And if I try scanning it, it'll tell me if there's any money left on there. There you go. Although, yes, it, actually, it, it might think that there still is until it finds the first block. But okay. uh, we'll I'll do... check the previous one that we did. How about that? So I have awesome. it right here. Awesome. Guys, take them up on it. Do our guess the currency. Right? No assets found on the, the one we showed earlier. So somebody already got that one. So. Awesome. Well, let me ask you this. We've got a couple of developers in the chat, or we've got a couple of project uh, leads in the chat who've been asking about the, their fork of BCH. And they're they're wondering about your view on forks of the project. Um, not contentious forks, but either clones or forks that are meant to go a slightly different direction. Have you worked with them? Has there been really good support of forks? I know, for example, on other sides of the, the, the cryptosphere, there are projects like PIVX, that are extremely supportive of uh, fork fork projects such as Divi, uh, a notable proof of stake project that has then uh, uh, surpassed them in the stacked rankings in the market cap. Um, but they've they've attempted to offer a lot of support to those projects. How does Bitcoin Cash treat forks of Bitcoin Cash? I think each person treats it differently. But uh, the more forks and the more people trying new stuff, uh, the better. But one of the things that makes the network. Uh, uh, valuable is the number of nodes on that network or the number of users on that network. So I think that's the the only reason Bitcoin is still the top cryptocurrency isn't because it gives the best user experience. It's because it has the biggest network effect. And that network effect is really hard to overcome. But, you know, there's a lot of coins. That, the, the user experience is starting to be pretty bad on Bitcoin. So I think some of these other networks are going to catch up there pretty quickly. So, Okay. Awesome. And can I ask also as far as... Uh... As far as the funding of other projects, you you rattled off a couple of projects. You mentioned Zcoin, of course. Uh, you mentioned Ripple, and I think you mentioned one other at the beginning. Are there any of the projects that you that you're very vocally and publicly supportive of, or assisted in founding? Uh, so outside of the crypto space, like I just uh, you know helped put up the money to start Pronomos Capital, which is trying to do charter cities around the world, um, where basically you get a government to grant as much sovereignty as possible to some special economic zone. And so we've seen, you know, with other countries or other places like Hong Kong in the world previously, um, that can have a really, really big impact in a positive way. So we're trying to do that sort of thing. We have a free societies project. Uh, I've started to invest in a lot of uh, biotech, uh, life extension related companies as well. There's a stem cell uh, facility that I've invested a bunch of money in too as well. That's doing research and development on there in addition to treatments. So I'm uh, really interested in extreme human life extension as well. And I plan to start focusing more and more of my uh uh, assets that I've, you know, earned through my involvement in cryptocurrency on life extension, uh, technologies at this point. Okay. Awesome. So, okay. So within the crypto space, then you, you've, you've slowed down largely in the last couple of years, or this has just been mostly this year. I mean, the, the, the whole civil war and the split within Bitcoin to Bitcoin cash was a bit disappointing. Um, so I've been, you know, in, if I can live forever, then I'll have a lot more time to do a lot more cool things in cryptocurrency as well. So I, uh, and now I'm, you know, over 40, so I, I need to uh, start thinking about that sort of thing a little bit more than I used to when I was in my 20s. Sure. So you're hoping to see that last block reward emitted from uh, from Bitcoin Cash and, and Bitcoin then, in person. I hope so. Yeah, that's a, I, I hadn't that hadn't occurred to me, but yeah, I, I would love to be around for that. Sure. Great point. Cool. Uh, let me ask, as far as privacy tech, uh, clearly when you are a voice when you're a voice of advocacy for for voluntarism or uh, or anarcho capitalism, um, and with the things you've you've gone on record as saying, you must have a pretty strong view of user data privacy. How do people, uh, like what's one tool that you would suggest that the average person or maybe the average person within cryptocurrency should adopt or should use to increase their user data privacy and prevent uh, nation states or, or advertisers even from uh, owning them completely digitally? Yeah, uh, actually, a really good example of this. I was emailing recently with this guy that I knew through Bitcoin Cash, and uh, oh, the, the the domain name's escaping me now. But I asked, I needed his email address so I could send him something. He says my email address is something or other at, and I forget now. But it's as soon as I saw the domain name, it's it's the domain name that every Russian uses for their for their email address. Um, yeah, the index. A little bit later. Yeah, Yandex. That's exactly the one. Yeah. 
So he had something or other at Yandex, right? And I'm, I replied to him because I know he speaks English really well. And I even met him in person once. I replied to him. I said, you're Russian, right? Because I, I didn't know he was Russian. I thought he was some American guy. And he replied to me, he says, no, I'm not Russian. I just would rather have the Russian spying on my emails than the American. So that's why I don't use Gmail. And I use Yandex. And I thought that that was a pretty interesting way of, of, of looking at it. And then I met another person as well. Uh, he's just using WeChat all the time because he figured he'd rather have the Chinese spying on him than Americans. So that's why he doesn't use, you know, WhatsApp. And so I thought that was an interesting way of like have the the government of the country that you don't live in and don't have anything to do with be the one that's spying on you rather than the one that's you're know, a citizen of or that you're living in. So I thought that was a pretty uh, a clever life hack there. Okay, awesome. And as far as private tech within cryptocurrencies, uh, you clearly you've championed Bitcoin Cash because it is fungible or at least has been for there hasn't been uh, the implication of coin taint to the extent that we've heard in bitcoin on bitcoin cash uh, not that i'm aware of have you heard any of that or are there interested parties that are saying hey we've traced transactions or we or we've de-anonymized uh tumbling motions of bitcoin cash and bad guys are using it so we don't want to i take think it. we haven't seen so much of that yet but I'm sad to say it's probably because there's not as much usage of Bitcoin Cash as Bitcoin yet, and it's not in the media, and it's not as juicy for you know Forbes or the Wall Street Journal or New York Times to say criminals are using Bitcoin on the dark web. Is to say you know criminals are using Bitcoin Cash on the dark web because you know it takes an extra word in the headline and less people know what it is. But uh, Bitcoin Cash has some really cool privacy tech. So I don't know if people have looked at uh, CashFusion com or dot org you'll have to figure out which one it is there but basically it's shuffling up all of your bitcoin cash with everybody else using different amounts and the total number of potential like shuffling combinations that are there are more than there are atoms in the entire universe and so if you have a, a, a data set you know there are potential shuffling set that's bigger than the number of atoms there are in the entire known universe uh, that's some pretty decent uh, privacy that you have there uh, as well but i've i've been a big fan of monero and zcash and zcoin and uh, you know, these other crypto note uh, protocols like, you know, Boolberry is one that from a long time ago that I don't know how many people have heard of, but seemed interesting. Now I think it morphed into Zeno and, you know, all the privacy coins to me are interesting. But I love the fact that Bitcoin Cash is accepted at more than 100,000 websites around the world. And you can have really, really strong privacy on your Bitcoin Cash by using Cash Fusion as well. I think that's a really, really awesome uh, aspect. And it's taking us some time, but I can't wait to build it right into the, you know, 12 million Bitcoin.com wallet users. So everybody that's brand new to crypto, they come to Bitcoin.com, they get their Bitcoin.com wallet, and they'll have super strong privacy turned on by default for their Bitcoin cash and their Bitcoin.com wallet. I can't wait to have that uh, be live in, in the wallet that everybody gets there. Awesome. So it sounds like then this is on the roadmap then to have there be, uh, to have there be network-wide tumbling then. And... You can use it today on desktop, um, but the Bitcoin.com wallet's the most, popular Bitcoin cash wallet out there. And so once we have it in that, it'll be really, a, really, really a, a strong privacy network at that point because it's turned on by default for everybody. That's awesome. Has there been anybody who's come forward? I mean, and, and, you know, anytime you say like, hey, we're going to make this more private, somebody comes over to, to, to ran on the parade and say like, no, no, we've de-anonymized your, your privacy measure. I mean, there's no privacy coin that is immune to this treatment, right? And, and everybody wants to knock down the biggest guy in the room, so to speak. Um, so there's always somebody testing. Has anyone said that about Bitcoin Cash yet and Cash Fusion? Uh, not yet that I'm aware of, but th that's a good thing if somebody does figure it out because then you can make it even better. And it's like Monero is awesome because you don't know what's going on with the transactions, but then it's also horrible because you don't know if there's some secret inflation bug and maybe somebody made you know a zillion other Moneros and they're just slowly selling them into the market. And that's why the Monero price isn't way higher than it would have otherwise been. So like that's scary from a... Monero perspective, whereas with Bitcoin Cash, you always know exactly how many Bitcoin Cash there are, even with the privacy tools. So you don't have to worry about these crazy inflation bugs that you do with something like Monero. Another, I used to think Monero was like the end all be all when it comes to privacy coins. And then I heard an argument that made me change my mind on that though as well. The argument was that if you have the privacy turned on by default at the protocol level of the coin, governments are just going to ban it. And we've seen that happen with Monero. It's illegal to use Monero on any of the exchanges in Japan and a bunch of other countries. Whereas if you do the privacy above the protocol level, like you are with Cash Fusion on Bitcoin Cash, you can tell the governments, hey, it's, it's, it, the, the blockchain is totally transparent. You can see every transaction. You can see where every coin moves everywhere. And it's tr that's true. But then everybody's just using Cash Fusion on top of the base protocol, so they have you know super super strong privacy there. It makes it much harder for governments to you know justify banning that uh, that coin at all. So I'm a fan of the privacy tools being 
a layer above the protocol uh, level like it is on Bitcoin Cash rather than Monero. But I, I still own Monero as well. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I, you know, I own dozens of different coins. I'm not a cryptocurrency maximalist at all. Never have been. Don't think I ever will be. Sure. Hey, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's, those are most of the questions I have about privacy. I mean, what we, what we've been talking about and, and in our interviews, we primarily talk to either privacy coins or different decentralized uh, protocol developers. And we asked them, what are your plans to help improve and enable privacy? It just seems like, uh, again, along the lines of helping to give people better incentives to behave better. Um, it seems like right now the genie's out of the bottle with user data privacy. And I don't know if we can give advertisers better incentives th that they'll go for. We just have to shut them out. Uh, that's my take on it. important. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, with governments as well, kind of wrapping this up with a bow, what do you, how do you, how do you think you align the incentives of governments today with the incentives of individuals uh, to empower the individual and then tell the government like, hey, you have to entice us a little bit better if you want us to participate in, in taxes, for example. What, how do we start that conversation? What are, you know, where do we go? I think we just need to make everything voluntary, right? If, if you don't want to participate in social security, you shouldn't have to. If you don't want to fund a war, you shouldn't have to. If you don't want to fund something that you're not using, you shouldn't have to. And so uh, if we can build all the technological tools that empower people to be able to say, no, I don't consent and I'm not going to participate, then it's too late. And we've kind of seen that to some extent with, you know, BitTorrent and all these, you know, file sharing stuff is uh, the technologies out there where it's kind of, for the most part, impossible to stop. And if we can do that for just everything in general in life or the individual has control over their own life to do anything that's peaceful, that's a good thing. And then uh, governments will have to compete just like businesses compete with each other. Starbucks has to compete with Tully's Coffee. And, uh, you know, the dollar is going to have to compete with not just the euro, but it's going to have to compete with uh, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin and Monero and Litecoin and take your pick. So the competition leads to better quality products at a better price. That's a good thing for everybody. Okay. Awesome. Well, Nicole, did you have any other questions or should we try to take something from the, uh, from the live comments right now? See if we can find a, a worthy question before we. Yeah, let's find a question. I do have one more, but um, yeah, let's find a question from the audience because they've been waiting. Okay. <laughs> or is there anybody waiting? I don't know. Uh, yes. Maybe they just want more Bitcoin cash giveaway. So. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I can guarantee you they don't. Uh, I think I do see a question from uh, from the leader of a notable project. They will remain nameless for the live stream. They know who they are, uh, but they're wondering. We talked a little bit about your past. Talked a little bit about where you grew up. Talked a little bit about uh, about how you were raised in a, in a fairly religious uh, household, and that you started to ask questions for yourself. That clearly, you you it took you to all kinds of wonderful places and amazing. You've done amazing things since then. What are your plans for the next chapter of your life? You mentioned some of the investments you're interested in today. Do you have kind of a roadmap for yourself, a five-year plan that is maybe not related to crypto? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt here in the next you know, year or two. Um, I need to have the time to focus on the training for that. And then I, I want to focus on uh, investing in technologies that improve all of humankind. So I think life extension technologies uh, play a big role in that. And then AI uh, as well, of course, because you know right now humans are the smartest things on the planet. But if we can make something even smarter than us... Uh, Wow, uh, they're going to they're solve a lot of problems. And it's just a question of, you know, it's not if that's going to happen. It's just how soon that's going to happen. And, you know, life is short. I'm in a hurry to, to make everything happen, uh, you know, as fast as possible. So I guess those are the two next steps. And I'd like to maybe uh, take a step back from my involvement in cryptocurrency and be able to, you know, hang out and read more books as well, because I haven't been able to, you know, read as many books over the last decade due to my involvement in cryptocurrency as I, I would have liked to have been able to. So I think that's probably next. That's awesome. Can I ask related to that? How many languages do you speak fluently? Um, my Japanese is fantastic. My English is still okay. I took three years of high school Spanish, so a little bit, you know, un poquito español. And then my my Korean's probably about the same level as my three years of high school Spanish. So so there you have it. So got it. So you're not entirely made fun of when you when you do visit Seoul, but uh, you're kind of made fun of a little bit then maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can get by a little bit. So, although strangely enough, my pronunciation in Korean is probably a bit better than my pronunciation in Japanese. I don't know how that happened. So. Hmm. Okay. Maybe it's, uh, I mean, got a little bit of a Brazilian Portuguese versus Spanish thing going on there where you, you have to be a little more relaxed with uh, the hard maybe. palate. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you guys for the time today. I, I appreciate it. And I uh, had a nice time and enjoyed our conversation. So thank you guys both very much. Thank you. Thank You've you. been so generous. Appreciate it. Okay. Have a great, uh, great evening. Thank you. Thanks.
And there you have it, folks. Uh, Roger Veer, thanks for tuning in. Thank Good you. Night.